Okay, um, are you ready? You can tell it. Oh, okay. Uh, it's just that we need to put some of this cooperative learning, you know, for posterity. So, uh, okay, everybody. Uh, uh, this is the ninth week, <laughs> slowly creeping towards the tenth. Right? Um, it doesn't seem like it will ever end. Um, but let me just make sure that we don't have uh, any outstanding housekeeping issues here. Um, I do have uh, this file. I think most of your assignments are already in this file. Uh, if you don't have it uh, here, then you know, feel free to put it here during the break or right now. Okay, if we look back, we'll see that uh, the course basically has three parts. Uh, uh, the first part was uh, methodological and substantive uh, in about equal parts, and uh, I played probably more of a role in that part, uh, uh, but uh, through lecture discussions uh, and uh, readings, uh, we uh, arrived at a certain knowledge base. And from there, we moved to uh, group presentations along with uh, uh, some of the contributions uh, that uh, I wanted to make. Uh, and if we look back, uh, uh, then we are at the end of this second part. And next week will be the third part. Uh, and uh, just to keep us in suspense, I will tell you what the third part will be about. Uh, but in the second part, we basically have been doing a five-part thing. Uh, uh, in the first part, uh, I have done usually a quick review and background. Uh, I haven't covered as much uh, uh, in terms of methodological issues uh, because I wanted to bring them in towards the end again. Uh, and today, of course, uh, we are going into policy matters. And there are those Millennium Development Goal reviews uh, and the UN. And I uh, uh, have been involved. Uh, uh, to some extent uh, in looking at uh, many of these documents and I will share with you a little bit of that but I will not take up too much time um, because we do have uh, uh, here a group of two right? <laughs> uh, two presentations uh, so that's second part group presentation and after that uh, uh, if we have time we'll have a uh, brief discussion before the break and after the break uh, uh, we will try to uh, look at some other topics. And these topics are uh, the policy framework, which will be in light of uh, the presentations. So there will be some further discussions of, of the presentations there. And uh, uh, then we will move into global issues and global poverty. And I have a few handouts uh, at that point to give you, but uh, there are too many handouts already for this part, so I don't want to confuse people. Uh, the third uh, part in this part three will be the social accounting matrix framework. Uh, uh, and in particular, we will be using this, this framework to, to illustrate uh, how one can look at women's unpaid work and poverty. And finally, uh, uh, war, peace, and global poverty. This is something uh, which, of course, is very, very important. And some work has been done, but not enough, really, by economists in particular. Uh, Non-economists, uh, I must say, have done uh, commendable work. A lot of very commendable work. Uh, uh, and then we'll have the small group discussions, and after that, class discussion. Okay? So that is, uh, uh, that is the plan, and that's the way we will proceed. Uh, but I wanted to begin our, uh, uh, our review uh, first with this, uh, this idea of economics as being a dismal science. Uh, I think you have heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know if anybody has uh, heard the name Clary Hume. Do you know? Uh, it's, I, I should spell it. It's like an American <laughs> uh, Yeah, it almost sounds like that. Uh, but uh, uh, his full name was Edmund Clary Hume Bentley. This Clary Hume is his middle name. But he actually invented a, a poetical form, uh, which is called Clary Hume. That's why I wrote it down. Uh, usually it's a four-liner. It uh, starts with the name of someone famous. And, and usually it's, it's uh, a bit humorous. Uh, 
uh, it makes fun of the famous person, so to speak. And uh, this Edmund Clarence Bentley in 1905, uh, which some of you may recall as the famous Jeremy Einstein, published a lot of his papers. Uh, in 1905, he wrote this about John Stuart Mill. And I'll read it to you. It says, John Stuart Mill, by a mighty effort of will, overcame his natural bonhomie and wrote Principles of Political Economy. Well, which suggests that principles of political economy isn't exactly friendly to humans, <laughs> right? Uh, if you put the third and fourth lines together. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in this course, however, our, our approach has been just the opposite. Uh, we have tried to argue uh, uh, and show uh, that uh, political economy actually uh, uh, can be and is in fact about human beings. Uh, but to do that, we have to take a somewhat different approach, a more social approach, uh, shall we say, uh, to political economy. And that's what we have been doing. Uh, if you uh, go back and remember uh, from the very first week until now what uh, we had done, uh, we have been trying to do exactly that. Uh, now let me move to some methodological issues. Uh, uh, everybody has this handout? This one there. Uh, the working vocabulary of models of inquiry. Yeah. Well, if you uh, look through this, again, this is uh, a bit sketchy, uh, and I don't uh, want to claim that uh, this describes everything and covers all the subtleties. Uh, and as we all are aware by now, uh, there are many subtleties uh, uh, in, in, in talking about methodology. Uh, but roughly, uh, this table divides things into three. Uh, uh, scientific statistical, interpretive, uh, sociology, anthropology, uh, uh, although those disciplines use scientific statistical methods as well, and historical interpretations. Uh, and uh, there are several uh, features that uh, are identified here uh, in terms of level, both micro and macro. And uh, if you look through the column of scientific statistical, micro level looks at Behavior of individuals, actually, individual firms or individual uh, uh, human beings or families. Uh, macro level is the structure of the system, the economy as a whole, uh, the global economy as a whole for our purpose. Uh, and usually uh, you use data or observations. Uh, uh, source of data is behavior of uh, uh, individuals or the system. And uh, there are variables that are used as units of analysis and you want to uh, relate these variables. Uh, the result is an explanation and answer to usually a how question. Uh, how does something come to be? Um, and observer is supposed to be neutral, but of course uh, in today's science we, we know that uh, it is not true. Um, uh, and then core metaphor is, is cause. You want to do some kind of causal analysis. Again, uh, there are uh, have been uh, schools of philosophy of science where the notion of causality is actually quite thin, uh, especially people who follow uh, Hume uh, and, and the empiricist tradition. Uh, but people uh, like me, and intuitively you probably also are like me, uh, who are scientific realists, so to speak, uh, uh, who think that theoretical terms actually are approximately true and refer to some kind of reality, uh, for them, I think cause is very, very important. Uh, um, now, let's uh, just go to the generic research question. Uh, it can be posed as what factors explain an outcome? <coughs> it's not the only way to pose that question, but uh, that's uh, uh, one way of posing it. Uh, in the interpretive uh, uh, systems, uh, symbols and culture, interaction, those are important things. Uh, uh, you usually rely on field notes. Uh, and uh, you want to have insight and understanding. Uh, observer is also a participant, usually. Uh, and meaning is, is what really you are looking for. But you are looking for meaning in the other one, too. Um, now, uh, the question that you can pose, then, as a core question, would be uh, how are meanings constructed in interaction and in social worlds? Historical interpretations, well, again, you know, there, there are many controversies there. Uh, uh, some people, uh, like the uh, 19th century French poet, I think Lamartin, who said that uh, history is the trick uh, that the living play upon the dead. 
uh, and maybe in some sense it is true. And Henry Ford, of course, is uh, famous or infamous for having said that all history is bunk. Uh, but uh, who was the name of that French guy who said that? Lamartin. Uh, you have to write that down. <laughs> okay. Uh, oops. I like that quote a lot. Can you repeat the quote? Huh? Can you repeat the quote? History is the trick that the living play upon the dead. Um, yeah, I don't know if there is an E here. Uh, there may be a maybe an E. There is no more time. Okay. Uh, but uh, history can also be studied, uh, uh, I think, with uh, uh, some benefit. Uh, if you want to really figure out some patterns, uh, uh, know something about historical processes, and again, to figure out the meaning of historical events. Uh, uh, and the key question there to ask would be, what processes lead to events? What processes lead to events? Now, in this course, we have covered uh, uh, really um, uh, by example, uh, uh, if not directly, uh, uh, all three approaches uh, uh, and some more, uh, really. Uh, but uh, these three, of course, don't exhaust all the methods that are available uh, and should not exhaust all the methods that are available. Uh, but uh, I think it is illustrative of the richness of uh, what we try to study in, uh, in, in social science. Uh, and in particular, in looking at global poverty and human rights, uh, we need to bring in all of them and, and much more, uh, uh, including ethics uh, uh, and ontology and uh, various other things uh, that from time to time we have also alluded to and have discussed. So let me just pause here and see if there are some questions or comments. Could you define historiography for me? I think I have an idea, but. Yeah, literally historiography means writing history. Okay. But uh, as a discipline or sub-discipline within history, uh, it means uh, uh, answering the question, how do we really write history? Okay. Uh, and there are various schools, but uh, in the 19th century, there emerged a scientific school of of history where facts became very important. Mm -hmm. um, German history, historians like Ranka uh, led this movement. Uh, you know, how do we know what historical facts are then becomes a very important question. Well, that would be uh, in German, that would be the history versus Geschichte. Huh? Well, uh, uh, Geschichte is also uh, history, but it really it literally means story. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so actually in, in 19th century that was the uh, distinguishing uh, mark in a way that how do you distinguish between history which is scientific and history which is story or uh -huh. storytelling. Um, two years ago I actually reviewed a book uh, by a, a very uh, good historian. Um, his name is Guha. And this, uh, this is a small book uh, it's called History at the Limit of World History. Uh, and there he actually defends uh, the story idea of history uh, against the so-called scientific idea of history. And uh, uh, he wants to write history from below. Uh, uh, this also uh, sometimes is called subaltern history. Other uh, questions or issues about history or some other material? Yeah. Well, if you go, if you, uh, uh, yeah, David. You said that uh, these aren't the only three models, that there might be some others. Uh, uh, could you suggest you know, another uh, one or two? And I was thinking yeah. about the affective realm. Uh, affective realm, that's right. Yeah. 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 Actually, I, I, I mean to okay. talk about that later uh, okay. during the course, but I'm glad you, you brought that up. Uh, there is the affective realm, which can be part of the storytelling or poetry or music. Uh, uh, if you think of uh, uh, understanding other traditions, for example, uh, or one's own tradition, uh, uh, music plays a great part, I think, uh, in, in, and 
and storytelling of, of the resource, uh, trying to create a meaning of, of collective experiences. I think these are very, very important uh, avenues. Uh, so they could be under interpretive uh, uh, column there, but actually they are distinct enough to deserve their own columns, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then we, uh, of course, read something from Krishnamurti. I think Krishnamurti goes, uh, uh, I mean, he takes us to the limit of what is discussable uh, verbally and then beyond it. So one could actually go all the way you know, to that limit and, and beyond. What about uh, uh, to have and, and to, to be? What, uh, could, we, could we view uh, Fromm's book as a model of, of inquiry? And In some way it is, but you can, you can see that it combines several different approaches. Yeah, it has, I don't think it neatly fits into any No, of it doesn't neatly fit. Yeah. And it's a very good example, actually, to have brought out for that reason, because um, uh, you know, this is uh, basically a, a, a kind of uh, attempt to fit uh, reality into a textbook pattern, uh, which uh, reality doesn't quite uh, eagerly want to do. Uh, and, and when you look at uh, a concrete example like Fromm, you see different aspects of, of, of some of these things. But mainly it is interpretive and historical. But it goes beyond those two uh, because it also deals with uh, old texts. Uh, so it has uh, a kind of almost hermeneutic uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, exercise, uh, at least uh, implicitly and in parts explicitly, uh, where, where he talks about Meister Eckhart. Uh, so uh, from is uh, indeed a very complex text in that, in that sense. Anything else? OK, let me now quickly uh, turn to the third thing before I turn it over uh, uh, to this group. Uh, the Millennium Development Goal reviews. Uh, uh, we all know that Millennium Development Goals uh, uh, were promulgated by the UN. Uh, uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan himself took the initiative and uh, later asked uh, Jeff Sachs actually to be one of the persons to be involved uh, in this. Um, and I had the uh, privilege of, uh, though I don't know if I should call it pleasure, as the cliche goes, uh, <laughs> of, of uh, really uh, uh, being involved in terms of reviewing uh, a whole uh, group of country reports of uh, uh, this Millennium Development Goal uh, uh, reviews uh, from Asia and Africa. The purpose, uh, which I'm happy to say, is uh, uh, being served to some extent. I, I do not want to claim that uh, uh, it is 100% success, but it is being um, served to, to some extent. Uh, the purpose was uh, to uh, offer the countries that were in need in, in reaching these goals uh, a kind of integrated package of services. Uh, and I discussed that in my paper. Uh, and But for that, you needed to know to what extent they were meeting these goals and to what extent they are falling short of these goals. Uh, now everybody knows those eight goals, right? And uh, uh, I don't want to take away your thunder, so I don't want to discuss uh, <laughs> the Millennium Development Goals and, and their import and those things. I'll, I'll let you discuss uh, uh, at least the first goal. Uh, but uh, they range all the way from, from attacking poverty to forming global partnership. Um, and there are many questions that one can raise, and I'm sure we will be raising many of those questions uh, uh, during our session. Um, but uh, let me just uh, uh, simply indicate that uh, uh, these Millennium Development Goals, in a sense, uh, are unique uh, uh, because uh, before people have talked in terms of rhetoric, but they haven't really set specific targets and specific dates uh, to meet those targets uh, uh, in as comprehensive a way as these goals are. Still, they are not comprehensive enough. Uh, I should be quick to add. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, they go a lot farther than past attempts uh, in this direction. And in that sense, I think uh, uh, they definitely uh, take us uh, in a somewhat new direction. Uh, it's not entirely new, but it is somewhat new. Uh, and uh, uh, people have been uh, uh, going around the world, you know, trying to uh, build up uh, support uh, and gather uh, influential voices. Uh, and to some extent, I think they have been uh, successful in this, but uh, they need to go a lot further. 
uh, in my report, I discussed uh, uh, along very specific dimensions uh, uh, how much progress countries are making and how far short they are of making progress. Uh, but I probably have said enough in, in the way of background, and uh, now I can turn it over to Laura and Catherine, and they can tell us uh, how to make policies and what kind of policies ought to be made. And there are a lot of ways to think about it, so this is absolutely not comprehensive, but I just look at it from two different perspectives. First of all, um, I think that in order for human rights to be implemented, there needs to be universal recognition that all human beings must be treated with equal concern and respect. This is adapted from what Donnelly once said about the citizens that have to be treated with equal concern and respect, and I want to take it a step further and say that all human beings, not just citizens, have to be treated as such. And this we'll be discussing more later when we talk about the role of nation states towards its citizens in particular. In order for this treatment to actually take place, um, we need four factors. We need democratic principles to be in place. We need economic freedoms to be happening. We need social opportunities to be available. And because human rights are supposed to be universal, it doesn't exclude the fact that you need a lot of cultural sensibility as an implementer, as a promoter, to allow this human rights to flourish. A completely different approach to those conditions is talking, uh, referring to what Nussbaum calls her human capabilities. I'm not going to go too, into details about it, but I want to argue that before the civil political rights can be implemented, the, the human being needs those capabilities to function and to appreciate and then to exercise those rights. So those are just two perspectives on conditions. Now, those conditions are not always easy to create because of various challenges that occur. Again, this is not comprehensive at all. Those are just ideas. Um, sovereignty is a major challenge to implementing human rights, and I'll be talking about this a lot more when I talk about the role of the nation state, the nation state. Resources are a problem. This is related to the class topic of poverty. When you look at poverty as limitation, limits, limited access to resources, you realize that it's a problem. History, <coughs> history creates a lot of grievances, and grievances often benefit themselves later as human rights violation, as we see with of minorities and things like that. Uh, power and leadership can be very harmful, especially when it's stated with corruption. Cultural values, again, as I mentioned earlier, is a major problem. Religion could be under cultural, but I think it's becoming much more of a problem on its own in today's world. And lastly, some argue that globalization is a challenge to human rights, but as the second half of my presentation is about, I'm gonna show that globalization is actually an opportunity for human rights to be implemented. So now the role of the nation states. Um, historically, there has been a very state-centric, state-focused conception of human rights and its, and its implementation, in particular um, with the idea of the social contract, where individuals willingly give up some of their rights so that the state can better fulfill its duty of implementing those rights and of protecting the citizens. And in doing this, the state has, in upholding the social com contract, the state has two roles. On the one hand, positive, positive roles, which means that the state has to take proactive um, actions in order to create conditions that allow people to exercise those rights. At the same time, they, the state plays a negative role in that it just refrains from doing certain things that would violate human rights. Um, now, someone may object that human rights today, as opposed to at the time when the social contract was thought about, have been largely international, uh, internationalized. This is true, but it's the, implementa the implementation remains at the national level. So what international human rights regime do is actually supervise how the state is 
promoting those rights or protecting those rights and had a relationship between the state and the citizens or the people have them, but they're not actually there to implement those rights exclusively. Um, so what we should, I guess the main, the main thing, well, uh, another way that the state can play an active role in implementing human rights is in the context of intergovernmental organization. And this is a lot of what um, the policies that Sachs suggested in his Vienna Poverty is mostly focused on the role of the state through intergovernmental organizations, the IMF, World Bank, UN, just a lot of them. But the main argument, I think, on the role of the state and what makes it extremely challenging to deal with is that the state is both a protector but also a violator of human rights. That's the major, major challenge. Now we move to the role of the civil society in implementing human rights. Um, one interesting thing about the role of civil society is that it uses human rights both as a means to achieve and to promote more human rights, as well as at the end to reach this higher level of human rights. So it's sort of an endless loop of means and ends. The role, the specific roles, those are just four ideas of what civil society does. It collects information about human rights, it lobbies, does long-term education, and provides services to victims of human rights. It's just nothing new, just a review of what civil society does. And then there's an author called Jose Alonso, who came up with this idea of the new multilateralism, since we're in this multilateral world, we should talk about a new version of multilateralism, where, um, where NGOs can actually coordinate their action much better than working as independent hubs of civil society around a globalized world. This is virtually a particular importance in the context of the global north and the global south. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask about that. In one of our readings, there was reference to a uh, social parliaments, I think, um, and I've heard about that before in a paper on um, Russia on uh, uh, social capital. The, the idea being that a, a a social parliament does not have uh, formal legislative authority, but it's like an, an uh, alternate um, uh, forum body that, that sounds very much like this, and I, I wonder if, if that's in any way, you know, tied. It, it, would, it would be the analog of the uh, social uh, forum, that's the analog to the economic forum. Does anybody, does that ring a bell with me? <laughs> no, it's interesting. There, is some, there is some interesting thought along these lines, uh, yeah. uh, 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 also with regards to uh, ecological uh, consciousness. Uh, um, uh, Bruno Latour, uh, who is a kind of sociologist of science, uh, I think he is French Belgian. Uh, he actually talks about a parliament of things, uh, which of course doesn't literally mean that things will come and represent themselves, but that our consciousness would expand enough to en encompass you know, uh, mm -hmm. nature, among, among others, uh, and that uh, we would have a civil society. Uh, organization or at least uh, civil society phenomena, so to speak, um, uh, where such voices uh, that we normally even don't think of as having voices uh, will be heard and, and, and discussed. Uh, so I think the idea is like that. The, the uh, uh, paper that I read, and this was in a, a professor in that piece class, was about uh, Novgorod, and it was about social capital, and, and what what lodged in my memory that when I saw that is that the uh, uh, the local officials mandate that the results, the discourse coming out of this um, alternative parliament has to be uh, uh, publicized. I mean, the, the press has to go to the meetings; they have to, you know, share, and that that is a way to um, you know promote the serious consideration. Of this uh, body in in other formal structures, I, 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 I thought it was a very positive idea, and I could see it being used not only in Novgorod but I think places here. You know, uh, so I'm just you know curious as to whether this uh, Al Alonso's idea has anything like the flavor of that. I think it's like the, yeah. What was his argument is that there is um, there are hubs. Uh, we're talking at the global level. There are hubs of civil society efforts of NGOs, but there is maybe a lack of cooperation between those NGOs. So it's not so much of a problem that in one particular setting, 
the work of the NGOs is not spoken out loud. It's one that there's no cooperation. There's, for instance, there's a huge barrier between the global north and the global south. We all know that. At the economic level, we also have it at an NGO levels. NGOs from the north come in and you know tell everybody to do this, this, this. But there's not really an equitable or even not equal, clearly not equal um, activity. And so what he was arguing is trying to create a forum where there can really be cooperation on an equal level between the NGOs and the civil society all around the world. So I mean, it is a time of this. It's also a, the idea of kind of a network of networks, that uh, mm -hmm. you have networks of NGOs, but these networks themselves need to be networked. Right, right. Otherwise, they're, at the global level, they're inefficient if they can't be. Those networks are not networked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so now let's put this whole nation state and civil society discussion into the context of the globalized world. There is a widespread belief that belief that globalization is harmful to implementing human rights. Um, for one point of importance is that economic globalization is in the corporate interest, not in the human interest. And Fromm has, interestingly, a quote that pretty much says the same thing in more philosophical terms. The development of this industrial economic system is no longer determined by the question what is good for man, but by the question what is good for the growth of the system. <laughs> so in this sense, globalization doesn't sound very promising for the implementation of human rights at any level. However, as Horton suggests, we should challenge ourselves. And if we look at the political, and he claims that the political future belongs to those who can have the courage and the vision to form new, new alliances based on a new way of thinking that cannot be defined by all categories. And if we do this, we can discover that globalization has a much brighter future in terms of human rights implementation. If we look at globalization in terms not only of economic, but also of political, technological, cultural phenomenon, we realize that globalization is a unique chance for the globalization of the human rights regime as well. In what sense? Well, globalization is an opportunity and an incentive for nation states and civil societies to actually cooperate. So for instance, um, states, okay, in the, again, in the globalization context, states are, lose their, are looking obsolete, or they feel like they're looking, looking obsolete. Uh, civil system, NGOs come in and they are very quick at criticizing states that do certain things, in particular violate human rights, but they're also very quick at uh, complimenting and uh, praise for, uh, applauding states that actually protect rights human better, human rights much better. So in this sense, the civil society, by disseminating certain kind of information, has the potential to remind states that they have that they have the potential to be states again in globalization. This doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Um, all I'm trying to <laughs> articulate. What I'm trying to say that NGOs have the potential to save the face of states at the global level. So an example, to make this more clear, you have the European Union, say it's a small version of globalization at the EU level. The European Union has major problems with its Roma rights, its gypsy rights. So there's a lot of non-governmental organizations that go around and criticize individual countries for Bulgaria, France, even everybody for doing bad things to the Roma people. On the other hand, when one country actually makes an effort to protect the rights of the Roma people much better, NGOs jump in and make it very clear that this particular state is doing a good job in implementing Roma rights. So in this sense, this kind of re-emphasizes the success of a state in a more um, multi uh, supranational dimension. So this was my argument. Mm -hmm. So also at the more practical level, NGOs need states, and states need NGOs, for instance, to arrest war criminals, to provide food and tents in these cases of emergencies, protect providing physical protection for NGOs when they go to the field is still provided by the states, and vice versa, states need the NGOs, for instance, for things that they don't have the time to bother about um, at the governmental level. So what you have, thanks to globalization, is a stage that is set for subtle interplay of influence between two types of actors, states and civil society, and all of this on behalf of human rights. It's kind of promising. A brief example of how... If, if I can just uh, share a little bit more about uh, NGO, perhaps another view um, that I don't see represented here. I, I'm reading a, a, a the Voices of the Poor volumes that uh, the World Bank launched back in the 90s. And uh, um, one of the major findings, at least in volume one, which is the review of uh, 81 reports, uh, they're called uh, participatory poverty assessments where the World Bank has sent teams out or has uh, funded in indigenous teams to go out to listen to the poor. That, that's the concept. And one of the findings is that the NGOs, the, the perception by the poor 
when, when it's unvarnished, unfiltered, when you get it straight from people at, at the lowest rung of the economic ladder, is that the NGOs aren't a whole lot better than the nation mm -hmm. states who are, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, persecuting and uh, uh, dominating the poor. Um, words like uh, irrelevant, um, uh, rude, um, uncaring. Now, the, there is acknowledgement that some NGOs and some people who work for them do a good job. But I'd say, by and large, the, the record is mixed. I mean, that would be a generous interpretation, at least of the, from the first volume I've looked at. So mm -hmm. anyway, I just wanted is to Is there any that. indication of uh, the, the size of the NGOs or the area, particular area where they're involved? Um, no, because really the first volume, as you know, is a meta-analysis. It's an analysis of earlier reports. It itself is not the direct listening report. That's in the next two volumes that I'm going to launch into over the weekend. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's, this, this is a new perspective for me, because until I began to look at that, this, the vision or the version that you're sharing here makes perfect sense. You know? civil society here embodied by NGOs and then you got the state over here and and, and the, there's a more complex dynamic going on. Mm -hmm. This is not, not, not to, of, of course, to denigrate the information that's been shared by the authors, but it's just uh, interesting that uh, that there is another view out there. So I think you have, to, you have to be careful as to, I mean, you're absolutely right, mm -hmm. and I'm worried about that too, but you have to look at what kind of NGOs you're talking like, what kind of NGOs did the world, did the, or that were interview criticized because that's again the problem when you have Western NGOs that come in into you know a poor country and says we well, guys should be doing this 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 and we're going to give you the technology to do this 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 and then once you reach it we're going to go away. Yeah. Clearly you're not going to have. But just like I'm thinking about Bosnia right after during the war and after the war, NGOs were mostly you know what were Europeans were Americans coming in trying to you know do post country reconstruction and then get out. This they had a horrible perception. The Bosnians or the the former Yugoslavs had very bad perceptions of NGOs that came in to help them because it was it was a really concrete help. Nowadays, however, Bosnia has a lot of, well, a lot, has a much stronger civil society where it's actually the people who create their own NGOs, whether it's group of women, group of widows, they're really, they're local, they're for the people, by the people. And I would argue that if you look at, if you interview them, they would have a completely different perception as to what civil society can do for them as opposed to 10 years ago right after the war. So this whole process, I mean, I look at the city building is a bit of a, buzzword that doesn't mean much sometimes, but if it's really implemented properly, it can hopefully get rid of this poor perception, poor, bad perception that the poor may have of NGOs. So it is the indigenous capacity mm -hmm. building that, that you would want to emphasize. I would think so. Because there's more trust, there's more, I mean, it's ownership of the, of the program, it's a completely different perception of what's... Although even, even at that, and I, I agree with that completely, but um, I mean, you just see now a lot of NGOs in, in developing countries have become more indigenous, at least on the ground, Within the country or the sites that they're working at, even if they're still run from Europe or America or something. But uh, I've seen in my own personal experience how that mistrust can still extend, even if it's the particular office or something is all staffed by locals. Um, particularly if it's still a foreign run NGO, it can, it, it, it can be that sort of separation in that, which is the fault of the NGO and their operations, I think. And that, so even if, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's harder to do, but, but, it, but it's necessary. But it goes beyond just hiring locals, you know. So. Okay, any other questions or comments on NGOs before we go on? Okay, please go on. Well, it's an interesting <laughs> presentation. That's why it's generally yeah. some discussion. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so one example of the big argument, which was that um, human rights can be implemented at all levels of the global low level are the mainly the broken goals. I'm not going to go into details as to what they are, but um, they were created at the global level through this millennium declaration, we came up with eight goals, what happens next? Well, at the national level, countries can adapt to different targets, to different uh, time, uh, basic time dates, into national challenge, uh, to, to fix their own national challenges. This is what um, Sachs kind of meant through his uh, differential diagnosis argument. So each country can adapt global ideas to their own problems. Take it one step down, you look at the community level, it is up to, for instance, community-based economics may contribute to implementing some of the ideas of uh, the millions of digital goals. Take it one step down, within the household,
roles, as they would argue, if a woman is if a woman is empowered, given education, it's going to have a spillover effect through the entire society. So you can start at a global idea, have a global idea, and be able to implement it in a single woman's life and really change change a lot. With this. So just to finish, um, one philosophical question, kind of. Um, it's nice to talk about change, but do we have the heart to actually change this? Or should change come before human heart changes perception? This is a quote by Fromm. For the first time in history, the physical survival of the human race depends on the radical change of the human heart. However, has a change of the human heart is possible only to the extent that drastic economic and social changes occur that give the human heart a chance for change and the courage and the vision to achieve it. Thank you. Okay, any quick uh, questions or comments before we go to the next one uh, by Catherine, which is on health as a human right. Right. Um, I am focusing on health as a human right and specifically the millennium goal, goal number six that says um, to help and begin to reverse the spread of HIV AIDS. Um, so before we start, I have, so I'm focusing on HIV AIDS um, as my health. Um, but to start, we have a little um, clip to show you. Now please excuse the fact that this clip says funny web commercial on the bottom of it. I couldn't find the original version, and it might be it's not funny, but however, it's telling, it's very good. Why does it say funny web? Josh, I don't know why it says that. Okay. What foundation was that? That's um, Vincent Saint-Fontier, Dr. Oh, yeah, yeah. um, who put that out there. Anyway, the big ball is the ball of people. Yeah. Okay. So in case you guys didn't see it, it's just kind of... Oh, uh, all right. um, anyway, so the World Health Organization Constitution states that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic, or social condition. And that comes from the Constitution. Um, so specifically, access to comprehensive health care, well-being, dignity, and bodily integrity are basic human rights despite one's position in the social hierarchy. So when you're looking at health, when you're looking at HIV, AIDS, you have to, as Sack said, well, Sack says all medicine is family medicine. This goes into his differential diagnosis and the fact that you have to look at the society, you have to look at everything that takes place. And essentially, while health is a human right, health achievement, achievements of the society can be attributed to the social arrangement, arrangements that exist within them. So a curative approach to an illness, such as HIV AIDS, is much more than recognizing and treating a physical agent. Um, you have to take into account economics and social determinants, you have to take into account gender, race, the availability of education, as well as geographic lo location. You have to take into account um, inequalities, because all these things influence one's vulnerability and burden of disease within a society. So, um, anyway, so there's that. So if we're thinking that, if we, we agree that health is a basic human right, from Sen, he says, a person's right to something must then be coupled with another agent's duty to provide the first person with that something. And so I'm going to do a case study in Rwanda, focusing on HIV AIDS, and talk about the nation state's role, the N NGO's role, and then also the role of civil society in providing this human right. So I'll give you a little background on Rwanda. Um, Rwanda is about the size of Maryland, and it's the most populous country in Africa with 9,907,509. Um, so it's the most population density. Of oh, density. density. Not like population density. You know, um, so nearly 60% of that population lives below the poverty line, and the majority of those people live in the mountains and do subsistence agricultural work in order to survive. 
but since the population is so dense, they're having a really hard time um, sustaining their ability to um, make a life for themselves in that way. For the Human Development Index, it's 0.45, 159 out of 177 countries that are ranked on the list. Those who live there, the average life expectancy is 44.2 years, the GDP per capita of um, 1,263, which is actually an improvement. Um, but let me just offer a clarification here. This is actually in purchasing power parity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So if you actually used the standard <coughs> conversion rate, uh, exchange rate, it would be actually much lower mm -hmm. than 1263. Yeah. Still a lot higher than some countries, so yeah. like, even a PPP. And can you explain the HDI again? Um, the Human Development Index includes, um, the way that they calculate the index is it's um, GDP per capita, and then um, adult literacy rate, uh, GER, which is gross enrollment rate of a primary, tertiary, at primary, secondary, and tertiary level, and then it's a life expectancy. And they take all of those calculations from the country, and that's how they, I'm not sure exactly how they do all the mathematical equations of it, but those are. all one third of it, and the yeah. education has two components. It has two components. Yeah. And then .45 signifies? There, it's that's it's the rank, that's zero a, and one. it's between okay. zero and one. So it's a little below one. half. It's not very good. That's, uh, the short answer is it's not a very good performance in, in human development. Yeah. And you can see that from the rank, that it is 100, 159 out of 177. Yeah, any of the human development reports actually would have uh, the methodology, how they are calculated. Right. Okay. Are we good? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so here's a little background on HIV AIDS in Rwanda. Now, at the present moment, it's anywhere, the prevalence rate is anywhere between 5.1 and 8.9 percent, depending on the source you use. Um, it's not abnormal for rates to be a little different, depending on the source. Um, at the moment, approximately 250,000 people are living with AIDS. Each year, 232, um, there, there are 232 AIDS deaths per 100,000 people. So if we were to take the population we have now, now at, almost, at about 9,900,000, um, almost 3,000 people would die this year alone just from, HIV, just from AIDS. That's not including any other deaths that occur, but just from that disease. Um, each year, uh, for every 100,000 adults aged 15 years or older, there are 3,133 who are infected with AIDS, and each year, 5% of all deaths to children under five are due to HIV AIDS. Um, additionally, just a side note, which I think is important. Of all, for those 9,900,000 people, there are only 432 physicians in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, so genocide has a lot to do with that, because a lot of these people who were doctors either fled or refugees or were killed. And um, the reason I point out the genocide is that um, the AIDS, the rate of AIDS, AIDS prevalence skyrocketed probably about you know two or three years after this happened. And to say at this point in time, eight to 13% of the population that is currently living with AIDS contracted the disease during this time period due to, as I said before, loss of medical personnel, personnel either due to being a victim or being a refugee. And then also there was um, a lot of raping of women and children. And the picture that I have there is a picture of a group of women who are um, rape victims from the genocide who have HIV AIDS. So now we're gonna talk about the role of the nation state in helping out with the situation. Um, so as of 2004, 56.8% of total expenditure on health is government funded, meaning that of the 100% of all the money that goes there, the government takes care of 56.8%, which amounts to about $12 per capita per year. And of that $12, 10% goes directly to HIV AIDS funding. So $1 per capita per year. Um, anyway, and then um, of all that money, about, I didn't put this in there, but about 85% of that goes to just people who are in Kigali, which is the capital. So there's um, a lack of money and expenditure on those in rural communities and those who are not so sort of situated in the um, capital city and those other um, big cities. So um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, what percentage 85%. of what? About 85 percent. Of that, 10 
Of the 10% that goes directly to HIV AIDS, 85% of that goes directly to the cap goes to okay. the capital. Okay. So that means that only 15% is being distributed in rural areas and with and people who are not living within those, mm -hmm. um, the cities. So um, pre the president, he, his response to all this and in relation to the Millennium Development Goals and realizing this is a problem, he, um, one of the things that he did was he created a cabinet level uh, position for someone to specifically related to AIDS and to specifically attack this epidemic, and that was in um, 2002. And then in 2003, the Global Fund for, to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and, and Malaria awarded grant money to Rwanda. And it was the one of the first grants that they ever that they were ever that the um, Global Fund ever gave out. And within two for the first two years of the grant, 13,000 AIDS patients have been able to receive free antiretroviral therapy. Um, however, the yeah. Yeah, I just want to ask: Is that um, uh, is the use of this uh, this long fund, the malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS, is that reflected in these figures? No, that. Okay. Well, that's not that. This those figures there are all specifically government related. The global fund is something that would come from the out. It's coming from the outside, so it would be the other forty whatever percent of the total expenditure on health that's accounted for through donations or accounted for through NGO activity or fundraising, stuff like that. Um, this just has to do with what the government does. But even that total <coughs> might be that high because the government part is $12 per capita mm -hmm. per year. Right. So if you add everything up, it probably is a little over $20 per capita per year. Mm -hmm. So it looks pretty bleak. Um, okay, but again, this treatment that they, the money that they receive from the Global Fund still is primarily distributed to um, capital cities and where there's a you know higher population and not into the rural areas. And the president recognizes this, and so what he did, um, and he tried for several years before he got um, Partners in Health, a nonprofit organization based out of Boston, to agree to do this. He asked Paul Farmer, the head of the NGO, several times please come into and help us because they have such great success in Haiti and other countries around the world. And so finally, Dr. Farmer, and they'd never been to Africa, this is the first African country they'd ever been to, and finally he decided, okay, you know, he didn't want to go into it until he had a lot of research on it because essentially their, method, their, their mission isn't just to go in and to leave. With Paul Farmer and Partners in Health, this, this organization, they go in and they go in to stay. And it's a long, it's absolutely long term. There's no end in sight. They're going there to set up and to be there and to help these people forever. And so he wanted to make sure that they had the funds, the NGO had the funds to go in there and to implement um, their program. And so when he, after reviewing everything and doing a lot of fundraising, and also with you know, a significant and several, being asked several times by the government to go in, he said, okay, we'll go in, which I think is really important that he has government um, support. And it's also very indicative, I think, of what the president of Rwanda is trying to do there. He's taking this very seriously, and it knows that he, the gov the state, the nation of stealth can't take care of everything, and is picking a really great organization to go in and to help out. So this is sort of I picked this NGO um, to talk about in relation to it, and they um, went in in April of '05, Partners of Health, and they um, redid the I don't know how to pronounce that, but this. Hospital was a hospital that was abandoned during the genocide. And so they went in and they stripped it and they redid everything. And the picture there is a group of people waiting outside to go into the hospital to get to get treatment. Um, so the mission of Partners in Health sort of started off as a medical approach, but then after years of being in the field and realizing that there are so many other factors that contribute to to medicine, all the social economic so social and economic factors. Um, and cultural factors that they also, um, it's sort of a social justice sort of approach now as opposed to just money, 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 uh, giving them money, giving them treatment. What they end up doing is they go into the community and if someone needs, someone's house needs to be fixed and their roof is falling in, they'll go out and they'll do that because they realize that if this, you know, there's other illnesses that are going to be able, that are, they'll get cholera, et cetera, malaria, that'll contribute to their ability to be healthy and to their ability to fight off the, well not fight off, but to live with the virus. Um, so it's a very sort of um, communal, social, economic approach to everything. Um, so 
since going in there at 05, they have tested um, 30,000 people for the virus, and 700 people received the ARB treatment at the moment. Um, they have about, they've recruited about 150 doctors and nurses and local, local health care workers who go in there and who do a lot of the work. And um, it's just, it's really, it's really great. The Clinton Foundation also gave them recently, gave, well, originally gave them $5 million to help implement the program, but they continually fund them as well and give them money. And then um, they set it up in this area, it's in a rural area where there's a, at least what they estimate 340,000 people who live there and who don't even have one doctor within, you know, walking distance for them to see. So they're providing, you know, they're they're giving them access to healthcare and to yeah. And um, you may be getting to this, but also I think like 80 to 90 percent of the workers who work for Partners in Health are um, Rwandans. And we'll go on to the next slide. <laughs> Civil society <laughs> and HIV AIDS. Um, part of the partners in health, their mission, and as I was saying before, this is a very sort of communal effort. Eight, as um, Sabina was saying, 80-90% of all their workers are from the local setting. And they call them uh, compañeros, which are, I don't know, like, company or people. Anyway, was a communal health worker. And what happens is they train them and, well, in this area where they set it up, but um, there, approximately there's a 70% underemployment rate. So they help these, they give these people a skill and they recruit these people and they give them work and they pay them, they compensate them. And what happens is, is if I'm, if I'm in a company up there, right, I have a group of people in which I work, with whom I work and I help, and I go to them every single day and I make sure that they take their ARB treatment, which is really, really important because if you don't take your AR ARB treatment, just like any other medicine, if you don't take it every day when you're supposed to take it, you can start to build a resistance to the actual treatment itself, which makes the, it makes it harder for you to you know live with the disease. So these people go out every single day and they're sort of the, um, the eyes and ears of the community. Because in addition to helping with HIV AIDS, if, they're in, if they go into a house and they see a set of people who are really sick, you know, of other things, they can report that back to the hospital and say, you know, over in house A, one of the kids looks really ill, I'm not really sure what's wrong, but maybe you should head over there and check it out, and the doctors go and head it out. But what's going on is um, there's a, HIV, HIV AIDS, is, there's so many things that go into that go into it, but discrimination, marginalization, and stigmatization are also all things that increase the, you know, the incidence and the prevalence of the disease because there's so much stigma against it. People don't want to go and they don't want to get tested. So they don't get tested and they have it, they continue to spread it. And so it just exacerbates the, the epidemic. With the community health workers, or people with their friends and their family who are going, coming, and so it sort of builds a community, a, a sense of trust within the community. The community supports what you're going through. There's a way in which you can get help and I'm gonna be here every day to support you. And so it takes away a lot of the stigma within the society and it really inspires people to go and get tested because they know that the community's gonna support them and they know that since the, the health workers and people that they trust trust the hospital, there's trust in, then they trust the hospital and they trust that they're gonna get good treatment. So it really helps to improve the overall health of the community and um, it's just like a real, it just facilitates really strong relationships and kind of goes back into a little bit what we were talking about last week, I think about caring and how Professor Khan was saying that there's sort of a lack of community and social interactions that is the problem. And so if you have a lot of social interactions and you have a sense of community and caring, then you can really, you know, you can really impact things. So it's sort of a sense of civil society and working together. Um, Within to fight this disease. And then I have this little picture. Um, <laughs> we all have AIDS, if one of us does. And it goes back into that idea that, you know, not just AIDS, AIDS affects everybody, but illness around the world, or illness in one area affects illness in, in every area. Not only on like an economic you know, level, but um, it's really important that we acknowledge the suffering of other people because it contributes to our own suffering. And um, as Nelson Mandela so nicely put it, it is not the kings and the generals that make history, but the masses of people. And then and I Will have, Smith, too. What? And Will Smith makes and history. Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I just have a little clip to show about. Um, 
civil society and sort of, I think this kind of, it has to do with poverty and it has to do with health and um, it's from the One Campaign. So I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but that's um, Bono's thing. But it has to do with civil society and having a voice. 